I'd like to give you just a little idea of uh, some of my philosophy of music. If you go back to the days of creation, as we have it recorded in the Bible, there's a very interesting day in that series, uh, the fourth day of creation. Seldom have I heard many sermons on this particular day, but the 14th verse of this first chapter of Genesis says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The one factor of creation that was different than the, that which was experienced in what we commonly refer to as eternity is this element of time, minutes, seconds. We're, we, we're a, a creatures of time. We tell how old we are, or we try to dodge it. Uh, we measure time. We get up by the clock. We go to work by the clock. Uh, we eat at certain hours. Uh, we're adjusted to that. There are days, and there are nights, and there are years. And everything is in motion in this universe. And when it was completed, and time was established now in the creation which God had made for this universe, we had an element that never had been in operation before. Time. And as you measure time, you get into various wavelengths, and you get into frequencies, and all of this which uh, modern engineering has uh, used so successfully. And when it was all created, God said, it is good. Now, my theory is that that which we have to make music, time, sound, which is wavelengths and measured into certain uh, beats and so on, rhythms, all of the elements of music were found in creation, and God said they're all good. Then you theologians know that something happened. The evil one stepped in. The devil never was able to create anything, but he had the uncanny ability of perverting that which was good to that which was evil. And most of the problems, in fact, I would say practically all of the problems down across human history have been when that which was created to be good has been perverted to be evil. And my philosophy in music is that the motives and the results and the aims and that which is placed there by the composer or the performer or even the listener has a lot to do with it. What is the end of the music? What is the result? What uh, mood does it create? What moods does it leave in the hearts of individuals? And I can't take a piece of music and just look at it and say that's good or that's bad until I found out how it was written, for what purpose it was written, how it was to be used by the person who was singing it or playing it or performing it. And so when we come into that, we can find that a certain piece of music, for instance, might be for good. Or we can find that same piece of music sometimes is perverted and used for that which is evil. And my uh, values in this mer area of good and bad as far as uh, music is concerned, and I've said this to many, many pastors in their conferences, to many, many musicians that I've had the privilege of meeting, it's the use of the music, and it's the aim of the music, and it's the motivation of that music uh, that results in whether that might be for good or whether that might be for evil. Uh, very interestingly, in the early days, there was much singing. Read through the Old Testament, and you'll find many, many places where the people sang. Read the Psalms, because those are the songs that they used in those days, and the Psalms were originally the music of the people. Now, what tunes they used, we don't know. We come way down now across hundreds of years of history to what we call the Reformation period, uh, or the Renaissance period, as it's referred to. We find Martin Luther now uh, having found that music had been rather sidetracked in the worship periods. Uh, music was not something that the congregation participated in. Music was something that uh, merely the leaders had. And Martin Luther, in those great days of the Reformation, began to get the people to singing. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, great old song that we refer to as the uh, theme song of that uh, period. Let me play just a sketch of it and see if you remember it.
remember the old tune, Ein Feistenberg, or A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And the people of that day began to sing. Now, I may shock some of you when I say that that tune was not written as a religious tune. Sacred words were written, and then they scurried around to find, and uh, you heard a few moments ago as the program opened that uh, Bach had written and Beethoven was writing, and different ones came along after that. And they found tunes that uh, had already been written, and they paraphrased them to fit some of the sacred words they were writing, as was this tune. Another one of the beautiful tunes attributed to the days of Martin Luther is a quaint little song that uh, they picked up a tune from a folk book of music, and they put these words that you sing at Christmas time. Children love it. A great old song, beautiful song. Let me share it with you. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. I don't know whether you knew or not, but that song dates way back to the Reformation period. After Martin Luther and his followers had uh, sort of gotten this idea of congregational singing, uh, into the thinking of the religious people of those days, along came a group who said it's wrong. It's wrong to sing these songs that are written, the words by man. It's wrong to sing some of these, uh, which they call pagan ideas. They said we must stick to the scripture. And they had a great revolution in their music in those days. In fact, we have it in just about every generation. One group said you can't do this, and another said we must do that. It was during the period when the uh, poetic forms were coming, and they said we must sing the psalms. And so students and professors were instructed to take the psalms and then paraphrase them into the new uh, poetic forms that were written. And so we had a great time of these songs coming. Uh, odd sometimes the way they stretched the words one way or another, for instance, in the old Bay Psalm book, the 23rd Psalm, the words sound something like this. The Lord to me a shepherd is, want therefore shall not I. He in the folds of tender grass doth cause me down to lie. To waters calm he gently leads, restore my soul doth he. He doth in paths of righteousness for his name's sake lead me. Yea, though in valley of death's shade I walk, none ill I'll fear. Because thou art with me, thy rod and staff my comfort are. For me a table thou hast spread in presence of my foes. Thou dost anoint my head with oil, my cup it overflows. Goodness and mercy surely shall all my days follow me, and in the Lord's house I shall dwell so long as days shall be. Very interesting were these paraphrases of the Psalms into all the languages they were taken, and then choral tunes were placed by the musicians to these new poetic forms, and we use them even to this day. Tomorrow I want to tell you what happens in the early days of American folk music, and I'm sure that we will find some blessing and some inspiration from some of the new songs that came into our thinking and into our experience during those times.